Um, I'm here today with two experienced teachers who are going to play the roles of inexperienced students, and we're going to talk about mass spectrometry. Now, why would I want to talk about mass spectrometry with beginning students? Well, for one thing, it's used extensively in all kinds of applications. And the kids are watching forensic shows like CSI on television, so I think they're interested in, well, how do they do these things? How do they know? And historically, it's a very important, um, simple machine to, or instrument to understand because J.J. Thompson, when he discovered the electron in 1897, was bending that electron in a magnetic field, which is really all that the mass spectrometer does. And I point out to the students the relationship between magnetism and electricity. The first thing I do with them is try to get that idea across that magnetism um, a moving magnet will induce an electrical current, and an electrical current has a magnetic field. And I really like using an eddy tube. Now, I'm going to give you one of these. I'm going to ask you to drop it through. Oops. I've got to take the top off. All right. So, would you just put your hand beneath it, and when you drop it, let's. Oh, right here. Yeah. Let's just see. Oh, okay, that's very good. It seemed a little slow. Could you hold it and you drop it? What is it about you, Margaret, your magnetic personality, perhaps? Well, I've got another eddy tube that I really like because it's extremely large. And all it is is a tube of aluminum. And let's see again. Okay, so you hold that up, and I use this frequently with uh, magic shows with kids. And if you've got two and they stand next to each other, it's really fun. All right, let's drop this again. Can you hold it up? All right, and we're going to drop this. Oops. Oh, that was pretty good that time. Can you do it twice in a row, do you think? Let's see. <laughs> Pretty dramatic, isn't it? <laughs> and my students love this. They just, you know, it's like a magic trick. And if you look down the tube, okay, let me, and if, in order to figure out which one I want to use, because I've got two identical looking pieces, and of course aluminum isn't magnetic, so it's not because they're stuck to the aluminum. So what you want is something metal so that you can tell which one you want. Okay, so now I know this is going to be the one that's slow going through the tube. It's a very strong magnet, and as it drops through the metal, it induces a current in the metal. But that current has a magnetic field associated with it. So the magnetic field that's induced by the current is perpendicular to the drop, and this is sort of slowed down on the way down. In fact, you can actually see it tumble on the way down. Okay, so why don't you two look down the tube as we drop it. Oh, wow. Oh, what? hit the ground finally, <laughs> all right? And we're going we're to um, insert a video of this so that everybody else can see it. Okay. All right, now, after we've talked about that, I usually ask the students, why neutrons then cannot be used in the cyclotron. We have a cyclotron at Michigan State University, which is practically in the backyard of my high school. And the kids know that they are doing research there. And I can talk about the cyclotron and bending these particles and whatever. But they can't use neutrons in there. And I ask them, well, why don't you think we could use neutrons? And they say, neutrons don't have a charge. And it's a moving charge that is needed in order to uh, be bent in a magnetic field. Well, we have a little analogy for the mass spectrometer. And I'm going to show a diagram here. The mass spectrometer works on the principle of bending in a magnetic field. Now, the amount of bending is similar to rolling a ball. Or, you know, you know if, I, if I roll a bowling ball and I tell you blow real hard to see if you can make it veer, you're not going to be very successful. But if I roll a beach ball, okay, because 
the greater its mass, the more inertia it has. So particles that are lighter will bend more. All right? But also remember this moving charge is bent by the magnetic field because it, it induces, a, uh, it, it becomes a magnet itself. So what we want to do is realize that a plus one charge is going to bend more than a plus two charge. It's going to depend on both the charge and the mass of the particle. And so if we took a sample, we're going to have to make it charged. So if it's neutral to begin with, what they do is they, they knock some electrons off using, or using a, um, a hot wire, tungsten wire, which will emit electrons. And then we take it through a series of magnets to accelerate it. And when that particle comes out on the other end, they're separated by mass. This was how we discovered, well, this was the proof that there were isotopes that the same element had particles that were of different mass. And so when we talk about why the numbers on the periodic table aren't whole numbers, we usually refer back the mass spectrometer data. But there's a lot of other things that mass spec data can give us information to. So I've got this little set up here that I can use to demonstrate to the students how a mass spectrometer works. And I've got a very powerful magnet that I've pasted to the bottom there. And just this little ramp so that I drop all the, or that I roll all the balls from the same place. And I have a piece of plexiglass. All right, so it's pretty straightforward. And I've got a ping pong, or excuse me, a pool ball here. You can tell I didn't spend my time in pool halls. Um, and if I roll that, where, where do you think that's going to land if I roll it off of here? Could you put your finger where you think? Okay, right about there. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Now, this is a steel ball. Okay, you can hear it. All right, we've got a steel ball here. Where do you think it's going to land? Maybe, maybe straight. Thank you, you're pretending to be a student. We, we need that. All right, so look at the amount of bending that I got. And so this is a good analogy for the difference for separating isotopes on the basis of their mass. All right, I've got another one. Where do you think it will go? It's compared to, yeah, bent a little more. Let's see if that works. All right. See if we get a third one in your predictions. <laughs> All, right. <laughs> All right, let's see. Oops, I've moved things. This may not work because I jiggled it on the. Oh, thank goodness. <laughs> All right, so the students quickly get the idea of how a mass spectrometer works. One word of warning if you have a very light one, you have to adjust where the ramp is because you may end up with this phenomena here. <laughs> So you have to adjust it ahead of time. And I find every time I move the blocks, I get slightly different results. So I always practice it before I try to show it to the students. But it's a nice analogy for the mass spectrometer.